I suppose it's good they're doing something about it. Now, this isn't the first time the British government has created a ridiculous ministry. There's defense, social security, health, housing, education, city wars. They're all <laughs> But this time it's funny for all the wrong reasons. Fortunately, the British suicide rate has been steadily decreasing in recent decades. However, across the pond, the suicide rate has been steadily rising since around 2000. But in both nations, rates of depression, anxiety, and social isolation have been skyrocketing. The rate of depression doubled in the US between 1991 and 2001, while the UK saw reports of depressive and anxious symptoms rise more than a third just between 2014 and 2017. One especially broad study, collecting survey data from 7 million Americans, found, quote, substantially higher levels of depressive symptoms, unquote, among Americans in the 2000s compared to the 1980s. The rise is especially bad among young people. According to researchers at Columbia University, rates of depression among the young have been going up six times faster than among the general population since 2005. Now, some people might retort that it's the economy, stupid, but that's actually not the case. A massive Gallup survey of over 2 million Americans found that people are less happy and more anxious and depressed in 2018 than in 2009, even though back then we were in a massive recession, whereas today... The lowest level of unemployment in the history of our country. This is strange, because according to many measures, life conditions have been improving for most people. Per capita GDP in the US has increased massively. And while many of those gains are concentrated among the rich, 21 bathrooms, 12 bedrooms, 300 sets of speakers. A recent study by MIT found that as long as you're not a male high school dropout, your inflation adjusted income has increased over the last 50 years. American Human Development Index ratings have also been increasing, from 0.860 in 1990 to 0.924 in 2017, according to the United Nations. We've seen similar increases in the UK. But there is good evidence that the same force which has tripled American per capita GDP since 1970 is at fault for these staggering crises of mental health. That the same force which has massively expanded material production has hastened massive social destruction. Neoliberalism. Plenty of other people have discussed what exactly neoliberalism means. For the sake of this video, I'll use a definition provided by Mike Contral of the Roosevelt Institute. Quote, the extension of markets, or market-like logic, to more and more spheres of life. Unquote. It's an ideology that has transformed both our economic and our social lives in ways that have precipitated this crisis. Let's talk about each of those in turn. The single hottest topic among critics of neoliberalism is probably the collective increase in variance in incomes, or to put it simply, inequality. Variance is just a fancy statistical name for spread in data, and today's income has a really big spread. But there's another form of income variance that has also massively increased and is arguably even more destructive than aggregate inequality. Variance in individual income over time. This means that not only is income in society as a whole really spread out, but each individual's income is much more likely to change massively year to year as well. In practical terms, this just means that people are more likely to be fired or rely on income sources that aren't especially stable or predictable. This fact was first documented by Dr. Jacob Hacker, a political scientist at Yale about a decade ago. He conclusively showed that since the 1970s, the proportion of people seriously worried about being laid off has doubled independent of economic performance, and your chance of losing half your income over a two-year period has exploded. And while the least educated are hardest hit, everyone has experienced a more precarious employment situation since the 70s. Academia is an extreme example. In 2005, nearly half of faculty were part-time, up from less than a third 40 years ago. And remember, he's writing this in 2006, before the gig economy really took off, and before the Great Recession hit. This means that even though most Americans have become wealthier under neoliberalism, they are at the same time more economically vulnerable. Precariat is the hip new proletariat. Most Americans live paycheck to paycheck, and don't have enough in savings to cover even a minor emergency expense. 
Dr. Hacker places the blame for this great risk shift on neoliberal ideology. He specifically attacks the personal responsibility crusade under Reagan, Clinton, and Bush, both in rhetoric. I believe we need to encourage personal responsibility so people are accountable for their actions. And in policies, like shifting from pensions to 401ks, cutting welfare, and introducing work requirements for government programs. Today we also see this in the gig economy, where instead of being fixed in one job, labor flows between a bunch of irregular side jobs. Economic life has become incredibly precarious for most people. I mean, just look at how often people are switching jobs these days. The result is a population under constant economic pressure, always one mistake or accident away from bankruptcy or homelessness. This obviously generates an incredible amount of stress. But it also has another effect. Longitudinal surveys have found that a general belief in an external locus of control has steadily risen over recent decades, especially among young people. This is fancy psychological talk for people feeling less in control of their lives, of believing that their life is determined more by external factors than their own actions or desires. A 2004 meta-analysis concluded that, quote, locus of control scores became substantially more external in college student and child samples between 1960 and 2002. It's pretty clear why. When your home and retirement account are at the mercy of the markets, nearly half of his life savings have vanished in a matter of months. 40% of his 401k retirement savings is gone. When your employer can fire you at any time, you're fired, you're fired. It can be pretty hard to feel in control. Ironically, the personal responsibility crusade has made people less responsible over their life situation. A major problem, since a sense of losing control is a powerful predictor for both psychological distress and physical illness, and also causes anxious or depressive symptoms to develop. The meta-analysis I mentioned earlier also concluded that an external locus of control, quote, is correlated with poor school achievement, helplessness, ineffective stress management, and decreased self-control. In 2000, Dr. Robert Putnam, a Harvard political scientist, published a massive study confirming what most people already knew. Americans have been getting lonelier and lonelier. Across over 400 pages, Dr. Putnam showed that in nearly every avenue of life, including family and friends, civic organizations, neighborhoods, sports clubs, political parties, bridge meetups, and bowling leagues, Americans have been interacting with each other less and less since the 60s. Just to give an idea of the sort of data collected, we have visitors over 30% less often than in 1970. PTA membership has dropped to about 20% of parents from nearly 50% around 1960. After peaking in the mid-60s, casual trust in strangers has fallen steadily. Professional organizations have seen membership plummet while fewer families have meals together. Not only have social networks been shrinking, but remaining bonds between people have been getting weaker. And while this book may have been published nearly two decades ago, the results still hold up. Psychology Today recently called social isolation, quote, a modern plague, and comprehensive studies in 2006 and more recently have shown the trend continuing. This should go without saying, but just to be clear, there is solid evidence that social isolation can cause depression to develop, accelerate anxiety, and even contribute to physiological symptoms. It might even be more dangerous than obesity. Dr. Putnam actually has a whole chapter packed with data on how robust social networks don't just prevent depression, but are vital for happiness and health in general. Curiously, Dr. Putnam wasn't able to explain the causes of this change. Now, he was able to dispel some common bogeymen. According to his analysis, the introduction of TV in homes since the 50s only accounted for 25% of the decline, and suburbanization only another 10%. A large majority of the decline remained unexplained. Writing in the shadow of the war against fascism, economic historian Karl Polanyi was struggling to understand a world which had effortlessly descended into the barbarism of the Second World War. 
Drawing on the groundbreaking anthropological work by folks like Marcel Mauss and Bronisław Malinowski, Polanyi observed that in the mind of the market liberal, creating a successful market meant that the non-contractual organization of kinship, neighborhood, profession, and creed were to be liquidated since they claimed the allegiance of the individual and thus restrained his freedom. Now, there isn't some neoliberal conspiracy to make you hate your family or stop going to PTA meetings so that your labor becomes more commodified. It does mean telling unemployed workers to move to where the jobs are, even if it means leaving behind their families and communities. It means busting unions, which were once the center of blue-collar social life. It means forcing both parents to work outside the home, leaving nobody to socialize the kid. In effect, it means dissolving the social to free the individual. The charitable interpretation is that so long as people are bound up with obligations to their family, their clan, their guild, their government, and so on, they aren't free to pursue what they really want through the market. Less charitably, the only way to force people to take part in the market is to prevent them from seeking refuge in those institutions. It's kind of like the neoliberal argument against welfare. If you give people handouts, they won't want to work. I thought you two were out looking for careers or something. We are, man. We're just getting a little bit of assistance to help us out over the hump. Likewise, if they can rely on their community to help support them, they won't have to work. Polanyi gives the example of Western colonial policy in his own time. European colonizers found that it was difficult to make money off of colonial locals because they didn't want to work. They didn't have to. Tribal society was organized in such a way that nobody was ever threatened with starvation or homelessness outside of a major disaster. The colonizers quickly learned that the only way to get the locals to work on your plantation or in your mine was to weaken those social bonds which normally sustained the locals, thereby forcing them to sell their labor to the colonizer to survive. The same is happening today. Since many of our networks have disappeared, the only way to avoid starvation or homelessness is to pick up one more gig or get another part-time job. In short, to make more and more of your time and talent available for sale on the market. Oh, get a job? Yeah. Just get a job? Why don't I strap up my job helmet and squeeze down into a job cannon and fire off into job land? Now, these networks aren't entirely gone. In the face of economic precarity, a record number of young people have moved back in with their parents, for example. But overall, the system has been transformed so that your only salvation is to sell yourself harder. Good luck. Political theorist Mark Fisher wrote that, quote, The current ruling ontology denies any possibility of a social causation of mental illness, unquote. People are depressed because their brain chemistry is off, which we fix by giving them antidepressants. Pierre's vast collection of mystery pills will fix my life. Dr. Michael Marmot of University College London recalls such an instance from early in his medical career. A patient at the clinic told the doctors that her husband was drinking again and beating her. Their son was back in prison. Their teenage daughter was pregnant. The patient cried most days and hadn't felt well in weeks. To Dr. Marmot, the source of her severe depression was clear. But the psychiatrist simply prescribed her antidepressants and sent her on her way. Polanyi was fond of saying that in a market society, people die of social exposure. And that is exactly what we see today. As neoliberalism strips individuals of the society around them, they descend into perpetual anxiety, depression, and increasingly, suicide. Having more stuff can only make you so happy. It's our social bonds that we really crave, as the Coca-Cola marketing team learned long ago. Turning this around will mean reprioritizing the social over the material. Liberalism, quote, believed that all human problems could be resolved given an unlimited amount of material commodities. But we should know better. We live in a society, so let's embrace it. 